I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Today I'd like to talk about one of the most fundamental op-amp circuits, the integrator. It's a basic building block that we can use moving forward to build all sorts of things. Filters, oscillators, automatic gain control circuits, process controllers, the list is endless. I'm not making music with it immediately, but I'm bringing it up now because I'm deep in the weeds of side projects and need one. The oscillator that we have uses a pair of current sources. I want to use a single current source rather than two. But in order to do that, I need to introduce a circuit called a current mirror. And in order to explain how a current mirror works, we need a better model for transistors. Demonstrating how that works, we'll need a circuit to generate a voltage ramp that resets to zero on the basis of another signal. And one of the simplest ways to do that is with an integrator. So please bear with me. It might be a little while before we're completely back out of the rabbit hole. I ought to give a trigger warning. There's some calculus in this video. But if calculus gives you the screaming horrors, stick around anyway. I'm going to keep it really, really simple. If we use everyone's favorite analogy, between the flow of electrical current and the flow of water, then our capacitor is like a bucket, with the capacitor value being its area. The current I sub C is like the rate at which water is flowing into or out of the bucket at any given point in time. The voltage V sub C is the level of the water in the bucket at a point in time. The symbol DT refers to the length of an infinitesimally small increment of time. And this scary tall S, called the integral sign, stands for sum. It means add up all the tiny increments of water that flowed in, in the infinitesimal increments of time. Now, in general, you need calculus to work with equations like this. But you don't need to know how to solve them here. The circuit is going to solve them for us. And it hasn't even taken a calculus class. An integrator is simply a single op amp with a capacitor in the feedback loop. It's easy to understand if you look at the two rules of an ideal op-amp and the definition of a capacitor. That is to say, the inputs of an op-amp draw no current, and the op-amp gain is so high that the output will do whatever it needs to to keep the input voltages the same. The voltage on a capacitor is the integral of the current flowing into it, divided by the capacitance. For the calculus challenged, Think of it as the height of the water in the bucket. Since no current flows into the op-amp inputs, all the input current has to flow through the capacitor. We know what the voltage across the capacitor has to be. The op-amp is holding the voltages in its two inputs equal. So the left end of the capacitor has to be a ground potential. It's a virtual ground. The right-hand end and the output voltage of our circuit therefore must be the negative of the voltage across the capacitor. Of course, we most often signal with voltages rather than currents. But the minus input of the op-amp is a virtual ground. A simple resistor is all that we need to convert a voltage to a current. That's just Ohm's law. The integrator still integrates. The RC time constant transforms volts at the input to a rate of change, volts per second, at the output. This circuit is really all there is to an integrator. But as I've drawn it, it's useless for most applications. To see why, let's go to the cave and test it out. Here it is on the breadboard. A 51K resistor at the input, and a 4.7 nanofarad capacitor in the feedback loop. A 1 volt input should correspond to 4 volts per millisecond on the output. Let's first do a quick zero signal test. I've grounded the input. I'll power it on. Well, that's not good. The output starts out at ground and immediately takes off toward the negative power rail. Let's look at it on the scope instead. Yeah, it looks as if it's falling off at a constant rate, almost as if it's integrating a constant negative signal. 
Let's measure that drift and think about it. Well, what do you know? Past Kevin already set the cursors on the scope. The scope says that the output moved 10.4 volts in 6.4 seconds. About 1.6 volts per second. Let's think about what's going on here. The problem is that I lied to you. I told you that an op-amp keeps the voltage at its inputs equal. Well, sort of equal. We need an asterisk here. A real op-amp always holds its inputs equal only to within a certain voltage, called the input offset voltage. That offset will appear as if it's been added to the input voltage. If we take the 1.6 volts per second drift rate that we saw, and multiply by the RC time constant, we calculate that the offset voltage must have been about 380 microvolts. That's actually better than I expected. If we look at the data sheet for the cheap TL071 op amp I used, I see that the offset can be as high as 13 millivolts in the worst case. That is not a stellar figure, as might be expected for a cheap part. And that's more than enough to account for the drift that I'm seeing. Lots more. The part would still be in spec if it ran its output voltage to the rails in less than a quarter second. We also have no guarantee that the starting voltage on the capacitor would actually be zero. It could be anything. We have to fix this. There are a number of ways to attack this problem. If we're working only with AC signals, we can stabilize the circuit with DC feedback. Or we can reset the integrator periodically to zero and measure the output before it has a chance to drift too far. Or sometimes we get lucky and have a circuit that lets us ignore the problem. Let's look at each of these. The first approach involves putting in a DC feedback path. The resistor's value is high enough that the capacitor will take virtually all the current at signal frequencies and the integration works just like before. At DC, the capacitor is an open circuit, and what we have here is an amplifier with a gain of 200. That'll magnify our worst case plus or minus 13 millivolt offset to plus or minus about 2.5 volts. If we are using AC signals of a few volts, we'll stay within the range of voltages that the op-amp can put out. We can use a coupling capacitor the way we did in the last episode to pass the signal on to the next stage. Let's give this a try. I'll put in the feedback resistor and power it on again. Okay, now the output isn't wandering all over the place. It's showing a constant 77 millivolt offset. That's almost exactly 200 times the offset we calculated from the drift. Just what we predicted. It's relatively tiny, but it still might be a problem for a sensitive circuit. Fortunately, for this particular op amp, the manufacturer has given us a way to adjust the offset. I've cribbed this addition directly from the datasheet. There are two pins on the chip that you can tie to an external trim pot and resistor to null out the offset. This isn't 100% ideal, because the offset is still temperature dependent. Still, it's a lot better than nothing. Let's add that stuff to the breadboard. Here are the new components on the breadboard. The trim pot, the resistor to the negative supply, and the wires connecting to the trim pins on the op amp. Now when I power it on, I see a bigger offset at first, but I get to tweak the pot to trim it out. That adjustment is a little delicate, only about an eighth of a turn. I think if I were to redo this, I'd replace the trimmer with a 10K one and a 47K resistor on either side so that it wouldn't be quite so finicky. Now let's put a function generator on the input and put this thing through its paces to show you that this circuit knows its calculus. I'll put the calculations on the screen, but not go through them in detail. The point is that the circuit can do them for me, Let's start with a 1 volt square wave. The math tells me to expect the output to be a triangle wave a little over a volt peak to peak. And that's what I see on the scope. How about putting a sawtooth in? 
The math tells me that the output should be a series of parabolae, concave downward, at a little bit over a half volt peak to peak. Looks about right. Maybe a sine wave? The math now says I should expect a sine wave of about two-thirds of a volt peak to peak, with its phase leaving the input by 90 degrees. Right again. It looks as if this thing knows its calculus. The biggest single problem with the DC feedback approach is that it works only with AC signals because the integrator action is rolled off by the feedback resistor. But sometimes sticking to AC is not an option. I can recall one time professionally when I needed to regulate the precise amount of light hitting a sample from a light source whose intensity varied over time. The exposure time could be minutes. I used a photo detector and integrator to measure the total amount of light. Just using a feedback resistor would have been hopeless. That brings us to our second approach, a resettable integrator. The idea of the resettable integrator is brutally simple. Put something in the feedback path to serve as a switch. When the switch closes, the capacitor is shorted and its charge resets to zero. When the switch is open, the integrator integrates. The integration starts with a clean slate. As long as it's finished before the op amp offset drifts things too far, Bob's your uncle. Of course, I didn't mean an actual mechanical switch, although back in the day I saw integrators that had just that. Instead, you'll want to use some sort of semiconductor switch. One popular option is to use a CMOS transmission gate, also called an analog switch. If your voltages are within the range that the chip can handle, the venerable CD4066B works well. For the full plus or minus 12 or 15 volts that you see in a lot of op-amp circuits, the DG211 series are pretty good. DG418LE looks to be the current generation. These switches are easy to use because the control line is just a digital logic value. Some of these switches come more than one to the package. If you like, you can use another one in series with the input resistor to add a hold function, where the integrator simply holds its value and ignores its input. For audio work, one option I really like is to use a JFET. They're much harder to destroy than the CMOS devices. They're reasonably quiet, they usually have quite a low on resistance, and they switch fairly fast. The annoying things are they require a negative control voltage, minus 10 volts or so. A negative 12 or 15 volt supply will be fine. And they need the input signal to be above ground, or at least no more than a diode drop below it, at all times. Both of these are often pretty easy to deal with in practice. I'm not going to breadboard this configuration right now, because I have another project that uses it coming out real soon now. That leaves the third approach. Get lucky. I'm actually planning to take that approach in the next version of our triangle wave oscillator. I could say a lot more about how to deal with very long or very short integration times, very low level input signals, or very high or low impedance sources. But I think I'd do best to dig myself out of the rabbit hole here and finish up some side projects. Next time, I'll try to continue exploring how transistors behave. I hope you'll stay tuned for that. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!